Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 97. It's about World War I then, what was happening a hundred years ago, and it's about World War I now. News and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. Now, before we get going, I want to give you a heads up on what's going to be happening with the podcast over the coming few weeks. Next week, for episode 98, we're going to bring you the sacred service that was held at Washington National Cathedral on November 11th. It was a really moving, beautiful, and inspiring non-denominational service. The following two weeks, we're going to continue to bring you the sounds of the armistice from events held Armistice Weekend at the site of the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. So, let's jump into this week, our Veterans Day and Centennial of the Armistice special. This week on the show... Looking back a hundred years ago at the run-up to the actual signing of the armistice. Then we have a great interview with Professor Jeffrey Waro, who gives us an updated perspective on the role of America in ending the war. Then something I find personally fascinating. We're going to take a deep dive into the actual armistice that was signed. I'm going to read you the actual document, and you'll get a great deal of insight into what everybody was thinking about. Then finally, we're going to close with some selections of a performance by the 369th Experience. You're not going to want to miss this. It's a recreation of the James Reese Europe 369th Regimental Band that brought jazz to Europe. All this week on World War I Centennial News, which is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. We're going to jump into the Centennial Time Machine and head back to the first two weeks of November 1918 and trace the events as they lead to an actual signing of an armistice. The war is almost over. At least it seems that way. The American and Allied people hold their breath. On November 5th, the newspapers announce that an armistice is at hand and that the Austro-Hungarian Empire has collapsed. The American government simultaneously declares that it has reached a complete agreement with its allies on the terms of an armistice, terms not to be negotiated but to be imposed on Germany. Dateline, November 5th, 1918. Headline, Allies fix terms that Germany must take. Demands said to be as severe as those in the armistice signed by Austria. And the story reads, The end of the world war is in sight. With Austria-Hungary out of the conflict, an announcement was made by the State Department tonight that the Allies had agreed on the terms Germany must accept. Secretary of State Robert Lansing announces on the evening of November 4th, quote, According to an official report received this evening, the terms of the armistice to be offered to Germany have just been agreed to unanimously and signed by the representatives of the Allies and the United States in Paris. The report further states that, quote, Diplomatic unity has been completely achieved under conditions of utmost harmony. And so the terms of the armistice were transmitted to Germany on the following day. Now, ironically, that's the same day that the New York Times announced the results of the national election in America. Despite Wilson's appeal for a Democratic Congress, the people had given him the opposite. A result in which both the Senate and the House were controlled by a narrow Republican majority. Now, the German army is rapidly crumbling and internal discontent is on the rise. This time, Germany does not hesitate. Immediately after receiving the Allied demands, the German government dispatches four representatives to the Allied lines on November 6th, specifically empowered to conclude an armistice. 
as the delegates pass through the lines on November 7th on their way to meet Allied military commander Ferdinand Foch, news arrives that the German fleet had mutinied and had been taken over by the, quote, Reds. Now, when false news of an armistice reaches New York City on November 7th, the citizens go crazy. Dateline, November 7, 1918. Headline, False Peace Reports Rouses All America. City Goes Wild With Joy. Supposed Armistice Deliriously Celebrated Here and in Other Cities. Crowds Parade in Streets. Jubilant Throngs Reject All Denials and Tear Up Newspapers Containing Those Denials. And the story reads... When the sirens and whistles and bells rose in a resounding clamor about one o'clock in the afternoon, carrying the news of the supposed signing of the armistice and the cessation of hostilities, men and women of all ages, all stations in every part of the city, with an unspoken accord, suddenly stopped their business and poured into the streets to join through the afternoon in a delirious carnival of joy, which was beyond comparison with anything ever seen in the history of New York. <laughs> now, of course, the war was not quite over yet. Although the German delegates ask for an immediate but provisional truce, Foch refuses, demanding that they make a clear response by 11 a.m. on Monday, November 11th, or the war would continue. Prince Max resigns as chancellor and rebels in the German state of Bavaria declare a republic. But still, Kaiser Wilhelm II hesitates, refusing to abdicate for fear that doing so would cause anarchy. And unlike previous moments, when the American government warned the people that the war would likely continue, this time it predicts that Germany will, despite the Kaiser's vacillation, accept an armistice very soon, even though the terms aren't debatable, which is the case. On November 10th, the Kaiser's abdication is announced, along with the new election to choose a democratic government for Germany as demanded by the armistice. Now, Prince Max's farewell is published the same day, admitting that Germany had lost, but resounding notes of defiance are going to continue to resound well into the future. Quote, our soldiers have fought to the last moment as heroically as any army has ever done. The homeland has shown unprecedented strength in suffering and endurance. In the fifth year, abandoned by its allies, the German people could no longer wage war against the increasingly superior forces. This victory for which many had hoped has not been granted to us. But the German people has won a still greater victory over itself and its belief in the right of might. From this victory, we shall draw new strength for the hard times which face us and on which you can also build. Now, the announcement came in the early morning of November 11th that the German representatives had signed the armistice and that the fighting would end at 11 a.m. Paris time. Headline, Armistice Signed, End of the War. Berlin seized by revolutionists, new chancellor begs for order. Ousted Kaiser flees to Holland. Now, not until the following day on November 12th did the newspapers report that the American forces had continued their advance right up to the very last moment the morning of November 11th. And little mention was made of the men who died in that process. There are so many thoughts by various historians about what America's role to ending World War I really was. Now, after all, America didn't enter the war until April of 1917, and at that time, it had a microscopic standing army. Now, you could say it had 180,000 if you stretch it with all the militias. It had no war industrial base, no large-scale international war experience, and it took until late spring of 1918 for Americans to actually substantially engage in the fight. How did that, in just a few short months, bend the needle in achieving an end to this massive global conflict? 
Our next guest asked that question and has drawn his conclusions, which he's here to share with us today on this centennial of the armistice. Professor Jeffrey Waro is the director of the Military History Center at the University of North Texas and author of a number of books, his most recent being Sons of Freedom, the Forgotten American Soldiers Who Defeated Germany in World War I. Professor Waro, welcome to the special edition of the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Professor, the title of your book reminds us about how far we've come. Why do you think that America blanked out this incredibly important event that literally transformed the nation? Well, I think it was many things. I think we came back and there was a sense, given all the turbulence surrounding the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles and the Senate's failure to ratify the treaty and the League of Nations covenant, there was a great sense that the war had been about nothing. The, the Germans were beaten, that we slayed the beast of Prussian militarism, as Woodrow Wilson said, but then we didn't arrange a peace that would ensure long-term peace and security. So there was a sense that Americans had done their best, but the Europeans had mucked it up by reverting back to old balance of power politics and inviting a new outbreak of violence. So there was a sense of just futility about it all. And then, of course, you had the roaring 20s intervening, you know, the rise of consumer culture materialism. And then quickly the Wall Street crash and the Depression intervene, which shifts attention entirely to the home front. And then you have the outbreak of the Second World War, which is even bigger in scale. And then the achievement there is actually monumental. And then it becomes sort of the great American fixation. And through this combination of things, the retreat from Europe, isolationism, the Great Depression, and then the outbreak of World War II, World War I is entirely forgotten. And yet the argument I make in the book is that the American intervention in World War I was absolutely critical. Without it, you likely have a victory by the central powers in a completely different Europe in 1919 than you would have had otherwise. And one of the most compelling things about your book is the position that it really unambiguously takes that without America coming into the conflict, Germany would have absolutely won the war. So I'd like to frame two questions on that subject. And I appreciate that short answers on this are going to be really hard for you. But one, why do you hold the position that America's participation was essential to winning the war? And the follow-up question, what is the counter-argument and who holds it? So let's start with the first question. How did we bend the winning curve? Well, that's a great question. And essentially, I began this project with standard accounts of 1918 in mind, that the war was won by this 100 days offensive led by the British and the French, and that the Americans fought a relatively late and peripheral campaign in the Marne salient, San Miel, and then the Meuse-Argonne offensive. And the way that the American effort has been portrayed in history is generally Americans will write books about the Meuse-Argonne, Europeans will write books about the 100 days, just kind of referring casually to the American effort as being helpful but not decisive. And the American books will talk about the Meuse-Argonne as being gritty and courageous and everything else, but they won't really relate it to the overall Allied campaign. So that's what I set out to do is contextualize the American participation, put it into the context of the broader Allied participation. And what became clear to me as I worked through not only American, but British, French, German, and Austrian archives was absolutely just how decisive the American intervention was. If you look at the situation with the Allies, they are really flagging. The French are literally out of men. They've lost 3 million casualties between 1914 and 1917. They have no more young men available as reserves. They've all been used. They're all in the front lines. They're entirely relying on the roughly 200,000 teenagers they draft every year, boys who become eligible for the draft. The British do have reserves, but they won't use them because the Lloyd George government is so upset with Haig over his massive casualties, half a million men at the Somme, 400,000 men at Passchendaele, to lose another half a million in the course of 1918. And Lloyd George just doesn't want to steer any more troops to Haig because he realizes that Haig will waste them in these offensives against hardened German positions. And so if you subtract the Americans from 1918, the Allies simply don't win. They were nearly beaten in Ludendorff's spring offensives of 1918, British nearly driven into the sea in the course of Operations Michael and Georgette, the French nearly broken by Operation Blucher. The Americans are able to hold long sections of the Western Front, freeing up reserves for the Allies to use in backstopping against those defenses. But then when it comes to actually clearing the Germans out of occupied France and Belgium, 
the American contribution is absolutely vital. And, and what I argue in the book is that if the Americans don't push in the Meuse Argonne, if they don't push up to the city of Sedan and take that vital rail junction, which essentially traps the German army in France and Belgium, doesn't allow them to advance or retreat, doesn't allow them to supply themselves, they don't take that vital road and rail hub, then the war goes on. The Germans shelter behind the Meuse, continue to inflict casualties on the British and the French, and eventually arrange a negotiated peace in which they keep Alsace-Lorraine, in which they keep much of occupied France and Belgium, and the balance of power tips forcefully in Germany's direction. And as for the counter-argument, well, you don't have to look far for those. A lot of people will say, look at the number of French and British casualties in this war. Look at the number of Russian casualties in this war, of Italian casualties. And then look at the American casualties, 1 55th of the total Allied loss. American casualties are about the same as Serbian casualties in the war. So they say, how is it possible that the United States could have won this war? And the point is, is that as sad as it is, you know, casualties don't bring victory. The fact that the French wasted so many men in hopeless offensives early in the war before they finally revert to a more defensive style of fighting. The fact that the British, under Haig's leadership, embark on these really harebrained offensives into German positions and waste so many men that they essentially make it impossible to go on and win the war. Somebody had to come in and win the war, and that's the American. And so by just adding up Allied casualties and saying, hey, look what we did compared to what you did, that doesn't explain the actual victory, how it was achieved. And I argue, and I think very persuasively in the book, using real evidence from the archives of all of the Allied powers and the Central powers, that it's the American blow that brings victory. Well, Professor Waro, thank you for coming onto the podcast on this most auspicious of weeks, the centennial of the armistice. Well, thank you. I appreciate having me on. We do have a quick question of time from the audience. Yeah. Coming again from Bill Benton, he says that he agrees with you that, as you say, the European nations mucked up the end of the war. But outside of General Pershing, who was disappointed in the armistice, how aware do you think the average American was to this right after the war? Did it take time for the average citizen to come to that realization? There's a lot of partisan wrangling about the end of the war. Newspapers in America at the time had a definite political affiliation. You had Democratic papers, you had Republican papers, you had independent papers. And if you look at them all, how they look at the end of the war, the Democratic papers are outraged that the decision makers will not consecrate the victory with Wilson's peace. The Treaty of Versailles, the Treaty of Guarantee, guaranteeing the eastern border of France in collaboration with the British and the League of Nations Covenant. The Republican papers see the League of Nations Covenant as being an attack on American sovereignty, on congressional war powers. They see it as too much, and they're willing to go along with the Treaty of Versailles, but they want to either strip away the League or they want to temper the League with carve-outs for things like the Monroe Doctrine for Senate war powers and that sort of thing. Wilson says, no, the Senate has to take its medicine. Independent papers kind of in between, they have the sense that an opportunity has been missed here to create a post-war order that will be conducive to American interests. So your average American, I get the sense, tracks alongside these newspapers. If you're a Democrat, you think that Wilson has been done dirty by the Republican Senate. If you're a Republican, you think we need to avoid these foreign entanglements. And if you're an independent, you sort of drift somewhere in between. Fantastic answer and feels like you're talking about today. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Not too different. (laughs) Professor Jeffrey Waro is the director of the Military History Center at the University of North Texas and author of Sons of Freedom, the forgotten American soldiers who defeated Germany in World War I. Links to his books are in the podcast notes. With that, we're going to start our reading of what was actually and exactly agreed to. What did the armistice actually say and who signed it? Of course, you probably already know that the armistice controlled relationships between the contracting parties until the signing of a treaty of peace at Versailles, June 28, 1919. Now, what you may not know, and what was footnoted on my copy of the armistice document, is that the United States never became a party to that treaty of peace, but signed a different treaty establishing friendly relationships with Germany at Berlin on August 25th, 1921. There's a lot to unpack in the coming months. Now, here we go with a translation of the original armistice document provided to us by one of our historians. Title 
Terms of Armistice with Germany, November 11, 1918. Between Marshal Foch, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Armies, acting in the name of the Allied and Associated Powers, and with Admiral Weimus, First Sea Lord on the one hand, Herr Erzberger, Secretary of State, President of the German Delegation, Count von Oberndorf, Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary, Major General von Winterfeld, Captain Wannesloh, German Navy, duly empowered and acting with the concurrence of the German Chancellor, on the other hand. An armistice has been concluded on the following conditions. A. Clauses related to the Western Front. 1. Cessation of hostilities by land and in the air six hours after the signing of this armistice. 2. Immediate evacuation of the invaded countries, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, as well as Alsace-Lorraine, so ordered as to be completed within 15 days of the signature of the armistice. German troops, which have not left the above-mentioned territories within the period fixed, shall be made prisoners of war. Occupation by the Allied and the United States forces jointly shall keep pace with the evacuation in these areas. All movements of evacuation and occupation shall be regulated in accordance with a note, Annex No. 1, determined at the time of the signing of the armistice. 3. Repatriation, beginning at once, to be completed within 15 days, of all inhabitants of the countries above enumerated, including hostages, persons under trial, or condemned. 4. Surrender in good condition by the German armies of the following equipment. 5,000 guns, 2,500 heavy, 2,500 field. 25,000 machine guns. 3,000 trench mortars. 1,700 airplanes, fighters, bombers, all D7s and night bombing machines. The above to be delivered in situ to the Allied and United States troops in accordance with the detailed conditions laid down in the note, Annex No. 1, determined at the time of the signing of the armistice. 5. Evacuation by the German armies of the districts of the left bank of the Rhine. These districts on the left bank of the Rhine shall be administered by the local authorities under the control of the Allied and the United States Army of Occupation. The occupation of these territories by Allied and United States troops shall be assured by garrisons holding the principal crossings at the Rhine at Mainz, Koblenz, and Cologne, together with the bridgeheads at these points of a 30-kilometer, about 19-mile radius, on the right bank, and by garrisons similarly holding strategic points of the area. A neutral zone shall be reserved on the right bank of the Rhine, between the river and a line drawn parallel to the bridgeheads and to the river at about six miles distance from them, between the Dutch frontier and the Swiss frontier. The evacuation by the enemy of the Rhine district's right and left banks shall be so ordered as to be completed within a further period of 16 days, in all 31 days after the signing of the armistice, all movements of evacuation and occupation shall be regulated according to the note, Annex No. 1, determined at the time of the signing of the armistice. 6. In all territories evacuated by the enemy, evacuation of the inhabitants shall be forbidden. No damage nor harm shall be done to the persons or the property of the inhabitants. No person shall be prosecuted for having taken part in any military measure previously to the signing of the armistice. No destruction of any kind to be committed. Military establishment of all kinds shall be delivered intact, as well as military stores, food, munitions, and equipment, which shall not have been removed during the period fixed for evacuation. Stores of food of all kind for civilian population, especially including cattle and so forth, shall be left in situ. No measure of a general character shall be taken, and no official order shall be given, which would have as a consequence the depreciation of industrial establishments or a reduction of their personnel. 7. Roads and means of communication of every kind railroads, waterways, roads, bridges, telegraphs, telephones, shall be in no manner impaired. All civil and military personnel at present employed on them shall remain. 
5,000 locomotives and 150,000 wagons in good working order with all the necessary spare parts and fittings shall be delivered to the associated powers within the period fixed in Annex No. 2, not to exceed 31 days after the signing of the armistice. 5,000 motor lorries are also to be delivered in good condition within 36 days. The railways of Alsace-Lorraine shall be handed over within 31 days together with all personnel and materiel belonging to the organization of that system. Further, the necessary working materials in all territories on the left bank of the Rhine shall be left in situ. All stores of coal and materiel for the upkeep of permanent way, signals, and repair shops shall be left in situ and kept in an efficient state by Germany. So far as the working of the means of communications on the left bank of the Rhine is concerned, all lighters taken from the Allies shall be restored to them. The note attached as Annex 2 defines the details of these measures. Number 8. The German command shall be responsible for revealing within 48 hours after signing of the armistice all mines or delay action fuses disposed on territories evacuated by the German troops and shall assist in their discovery and destruction. The German command shall also reveal all destructive measures that may have been taken such as poisoning or pollution of wells, springs, etc. Breaches of these clauses shall involve reprisals. 9. The right of requisition shall be exercised by the Allied and the United States armies in all occupied territories, save for settlements of accounts with authorized persons, the upkeep of the troops of occupation in the Rhine district, excluding Alsace-Lorraine, shall be charged to the German government. 10. The immediate repatriation without reciprocity, according to the detailed conditions which shall be fixed, of all Allied and United States prisoners of war, including those under trial or condemned. The Allied powers and the United States of America shall be able to dispose of these prisoners as they think fit. This condition annuls all other conventions regarding prisoners of war, including that of July 1918 now being ratified. However, the return of German prisoners of war, interned in Holland and Switzerland, shall continue as heretofore. Sick and wounded who cannot be removed from the territory evacuated by the German forces shall be cared for by German personnel who shall be left on the spot with materials required. Section B. Clauses relating to the Eastern Front of Germany. 12. All German troops at present, in any territory which before the war formed a part of Austria-Hungary, Romania, or Turkey, shall withdraw within those frontiers of Germany as they existed on August 1, 1914, and all German troops at present in territories which before the war formed a part of Russia must likewise return to within the frontiers of Germany as above identified, as soon as the Allies shall think the moment suitable, having regards to the internal situation of these territories. 13. Evacuation of German troops to begin at once, and all German instructors, prisoners and agents, civilians, as well as military, now in the territory of Russia. Frontiers as defined on August 1, 1914, to be recalled. 14. German troops to cease at once all requisitions and seizures and other coercive measures with a view to obtaining supplies intended for Germany in Romania and Russia. Frontiers defined as August 1, 1914. 15. Annulment of the treaties of Bucharest and Brest-Litovsk and the supplementary treaties. 16. The Allies shall have free access to the territories evacuated by the Germans on their eastern frontier, either through Danzig or by the Vistula, in order to convey supplies to the population of these territories or for the purpose of maintaining order. Section C. Clauses relating to East Africa. 17. Evacuation of all German forces operating in East Africa within a period specified by the Allies. Section D. Financial Clauses. 18. With the reservation that any subsequent concessions and claims by the Allies in the United States remain unaffected, the following financial conditions are imposed. 19. Reparation for damage done. While the armistice lasts, 
No public securities shall be removed by the enemy, which can serve as a pledge to the Allies to cover reparations of war losses. Immediate restitution of the cash deposits in the National Bank of Belgium and, in general, immediate return of all documents, species, stocks, shares, paper money, together with plant for the issue thereof, affecting public and private interests in the invaded countries. Restitution of the Russian and Romanian gold yielded to Germany and taken by that power. This gold is to be delivered in trust to the Allies until peace is concluded. Section E. Naval Conditions 20. Immediate cessation of all hostilities at sea and definite information to be given as to the position and movement of all German ships. Notification to be given to neutrals that freedom of navigation in all territorial waters is given to the navies and mercantile marines of the Allied and Associated Powers, all questions of neutrality being waived. 22. States of all submarines at present in existence, including all submarine cruisers and mine layers, with armaments and equipment complete. Those that cannot put to sea shall be deprived of armaments and equipment and shall remain under the supervision of Allied and United States forces. Submarines ready to put to sea shall be prepared to leave German ports immediately on receipt of a wireless order to sail to the port of surrender, the remainder to follow as early as possible. The conditions of this article shall be completed within 14 days of the signing of the armistice. 23. The following German surface ships, which shall be designated by the Allies and the United States of America, shall forthwith be disarmed and hereafter interned in neutral ports, or, failing them, Allied ports to be designated by the Allies and the United States of America and placed under the surveillance of the Allies and the United States of America, only care and maintenance parties being left on board, namely, six battle cruisers, ten battleships, eight light cruisers, including two mine layers, fifty destroyers of the most modern type. All other surface warships, including rivercraft, are to be concentrated in Germany naval bases to be designated by the Allies and the United States of America, completely disarmed and placed under the supervision of the Allies and the United States of America. All vessels of the auxiliary fleet are to be disarmed. All vessels specified for internment shall be ready to leave German ports seven days after the signing of the armistice. Directions for the voyage shall be given by wireless. 24. The Allies and the United States of America shall have the right to sweep up all minefields and destroy all obstructions laid by Germany outside German territorial waters, and the positions of these are to be indicated. 25. Freedom of access to and from the Baltic to be given to the natives of the mercantile marine and allied associated powers. This to be secured by the occupation of all German forts, fortifications, batteries, and defense works of all kinds in the routes to the cataract and the Baltic, and by sweeping up the destruction of all mines and obstructions within and without German territorial waters, without any question of neutrality being raised by Germany, and the position of such mines and obstructions to be indicated, and the plans relating thereto to be supplied. 26. The existing blockade conditions set up by the Allied and Associated Powers are to remain unchanged, and all German merchant ships found at sea are to remain liable to capture. The Allies and the United States contemplate the provisioning of Germany during the armistice as shall be found necessary. 27. All aerial forces to be concentrated and immobilized in German bases to be specified by the Allies in the United States. 28. In evacuating the Belgian coast and the ports of Germany, they shall abandon in situ and intact the port materials and materials for inland waterways. Also, all merchant ships, tugs, lighters, all naval craft and air materials and stores, all arms and armaments, and all stores and apparatus of all kinds. 29. All Black Sea ports are to be evacuated by Germany, 
All Russian warships of all descriptions seized by Germany in the Black Sea are to be handed over to the Allies in the United States of America. All neutral merchant ships seized in the Black Sea are to be released. All warlike and other materials of all kinds seized in those ports are to be returned. And German materials as specified in Clause 28 are to be abandoned. 30. All merchant ships at present in German hands belonging to the Allied and Associated Powers are to be restored to the ports specified by the Allies and the United States of America without reciprocity. 31. No destruction of ships or of material are to be permitted before the evacuation, surrender, and restoration. 32. The German government shall formally notify all the neutral governments, and in particular, the governments of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Holland, that all restrictions placed on the trading of their vessels with allied and associated countries, whether by the German government or by private German interests, or whether in return for specific concessions, such as the export of shipbuilding materials or not, are immediately canceled. 33. No transfer of German merchant shipping of any description to any neutral flag are to take place after signature of the armistice. Final section F. Duration of the armistice. 34. The duration of the armistice is to be 36 days, with options to extend. During this period, on failure of execution of any of the above clauses, the armistice may be repudiated by one of the contracting parties on 48 hours previous notice. It's understood that failure to execute Articles 3 and 18 completely in the period specified is not to give reason for repudiation of the armistice, save where such failure is due to malice and aforethought. To ensure the execution of the present convention under the most favorable conditions, the principle of a permanent international armistice commission is recognized. This commission shall act under the supreme authority of the high command, military and naval of the allied armies. This present armistice is signed on the 11th day of November, 1918 at five o'clock AM French time. And in a closing comment, including the document is, Declaration by German Plenipotentiaries. The German government will naturally endeavor, with all its powers, to take care that the duties imposed upon it shall be carried out. The undersigned plenipotentiaries recognize that in certain points, regard has been paid to their suggestions. They can therefore regard the comments made on November 9th on the conditions of the armistice with Germany and the answers handed to them on November 10th as an essential condition to the whole agreement. They must, however, allow no doubt to exist that the point that in particularly the short time allowed for evacuation, as well as the surrender of indispensable means of transport, threatens to bring about a state of things which, without its being the fault of the German government and the German people, may render impossible to further fulfill the conditions. The undersigned plenipotentiaries further regard it as their duty with reference to their repeated oral and written declarations once more to point out with all possible emphasis that the carrying out of this agreement must throw the German people into anarchy and famine. According to the declaration which precedes the armistice, conditions were to be expected which, while completely ensuring the military situation of our opponents, would have ended the suffering of women and children who took no part in the war. The German people, which has held its own for 50 months against a world of enemies, will, in spite of any force that may be brought to bear upon it, preserve its freedom and unity. A people of 70 million suffers but does not die. And to take us out on an upbeat, literally, here is the 369th experience, a recreation of the Harlem Hellfighters Regimental Band. This project was sponsored and supported by the Coca-Cola Foundation and the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. The introductions are by descendant Noble Cecil Jr. and James Reese Europe III. Our musicians are made up 
of students from 12 colleges and universities in nine states. They answered the call on the internet, sent in their videos for their auditions. They were selected and then they waited until this moment. We did have a chance to go to the New York for Memorial Day and we performed on the Intrepid the second day on Monday. We went down onto the pier where most of the folks were and folks were dancing literally on the pier. Again, without further ado, we want to introduce to you our director. He's the chairman of the music department at North Carolina Central University, Dr. Israel Butler. The 369th Experience. Now, the 369th was known by many names. They were known themselves as the Harlem Rattlers because of the rattlesnake on their flag. The French called them the Men of Bronze. Their German enemy referred them as fighting men from hell, and that gave them their most popular nickname, the Hell Fighters. And right now, they're going to play for you the American National Anthem, followed directly by the French National Anthem the 369th. Please be seated. It's New Year's Day, 1918, and the 369th come ashore in France for the very first time, and the very first piece they played was that song, the French national anthem, the Marseillaise. But they played it with such a jazzed up, driven, syncopated melody that it took eight or ten bars for the French to realize that they were playing their own national anthem. At that time, everyone rose real quick. The soldiers snapped to attention. And at that point, that was the beginning of France's love affair with jazz. And that wraps up episode number 97 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our guest, Dr. Jeffrey Waro, director of the Military History Center at the University of North Texas. Many thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our interview editing team, to Jay L. Michaud for his research, to Rachel Hurt, our fall intern, to Dr. Edward Lengel for his research and writing contributions, 
to Catherine Akey, the line producer and co-writer for the show. And I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators and to their classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast and a full transcription of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org slash cn. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts, and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The Commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us, and don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. Thank you for listening. So long.